It is now my pleasure to share a bit about our featured alumni speaker, Jessica Chang, who re received her bachelor's in business administration from USD's School of Business, now known as the Canal School of Business, in 2013. Jessica is the diversity officer for student engagement at San Diego State University, where she received the 2021 Associated Students Heart-Led Leader Award, and in 2022 received the Diversity Excellence Award in uh, the Diversity Excellence Award. Informed by the principles of restorative practices, her passion is integrating student development theory into the college experience, advocating for counter narratives and centering them through an organization's strategic initiatives. In her time at USD, Jessica reactivated Asian Students Association and was a founding sister of the first multicultural sorority on campus, Sigma Theta Psi. Go Toreros, she says. Jessica is a daughter of Southeast Asian refugees and is a proud bonus mom of two teenagers with her partner. Jessica, I invite you to turn on your camera and thank you so much for joining us. Can, can we hear you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be with you and have you with us and share your story with uh, with our USD community and our friends. So let's just jump right into the interview how about, and you can, I, I want you to, uh, I invite you to describe your journey with diversity, equity and inclusion. And you know, what sparked your passion to get into this field? Yes, thank you so much, Charles. And I wanna say thank you so much again, University of San Diego alumni board and partners for inviting me to join this series. It, touches a very close place in my heart. Um, we talked a little bit beforehand when we were preparing, but it's really awesome to have this opportunity to reflect on an experience at USD as an undergrad and how that's really set a foundation for my work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what sparked my passion was actually University of San Diego. Um, that was one of the, the nuggets I can see in my journey. Um, I took an ethnic studies course with Dr. Mei Fu. Shout out to Dr. Fu, she's still there. Um, and that really pieced together some connections that represented my family's history, represented how I felt in the US and kind of created representation for my, my family story, my story in the United States. And it made me see how powerful that is. The second thing that sparked my passion, and I mentioned this quite a bit in the past sentence, is um, my family, my parents who, who have joined me today on this webinar. Um, my parents' journey is very inspirational to me too. Um, both of them are refugees from Southeast Asia, um, I'm, I'm gonna get a little emotional. They um, okay. came here as teenagers and they learned English um, without any context of it and really provided, I can imagine, um, so much strength in um, cultivating a life here, surviving, um, and honoring their culture while doing so. And in a time where um, there was not a lot of representation and I've heard stories of mockery of them in their workplace um, when they came. So those experiences and listening to them when I was growing up taught me an important lesson of empathy and compassion. I think it really just ignited a natural talent within me to connect with people, especially in regards to the empathy piece, like the empathy piece that I might have not gone through what my parents had gone through, but listening to that pain, that struggle made me understand um, something bigger than myself and not just like my own experience, but others experience within diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, that's uh, the empathy piece is such an important component. Uh, and as is listening, and I'm proud to not have interrupted you when you were talking because I, was, I am trying to listen and be better at that. Uh, we've This is our third of the DEI series. This 
this year and uh, third session. And um, we previously talked a lot about both listening and the importance of it and empathy. So I, uh, I appreciate that. So tell us a little bit about your current role. Yes, so currently I work at San Diego State University, just down the pond in San Diego. Um, I'm the diversity officer for student engagement in the Center for Inclusive Excellence there. Um, another nugget of uh, family history and pride is that um, my father's family went to San Diego State University, got the opportunity, went through EOP, Ethnic Opportunity Program, and um, I felt a connection to all the San Diego colleges, I feel like, because I was born here. Um, but I was thrilled to go back and work at SDSU and make an impact there. Um, I started at the Multicultural Center um, as inspired by my experience at the United Front Multicultural Center at USD. And um, I was started as a program coordinator, um, went into assistant director and then director. And then now um, what I'm doing on campus is expanding past um, the cultural empowerment piece, but also the other part of it is allyship. Um, allies, especially since 2020 and our nation's unrest and murder of George Floyd, people wanting to take action and um, us seeing the movement within that. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored that through the leadership of Dr. Luke Wood, Dr. Jennifer Imazeki, we were able to create this learning and development piece at SDSU to provide to campus. So more specifically, some of the things that I do is um, honor student asks of inclusive education and new student orientation. We also have a inclusive leadership awareness training workshop for recognized student organizations. The presidents and treasurers go through our workshop so that we can prepare them as leaders when they're having complex conversations, conflict, which is inevitable, um, and cultivating an inclusive student org and the start of their journey in, in leadership. And then we also have another program called the Identity and Allyship Awareness Certificate. And that's some of the things that I do in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. So you're you're taking what you've learned and what you continue to learn and you're you're helping uh, teach students and and really leverage uh, the community, right? So that it, that it's not the <laughs> DEI work is is has long, you know. It's, it's I think it's come into uh, the national uh, conversation more, uh, a lot more in the last few years. Uh, but it's been a part of higher education for forever, and it's been, um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's just important to have that, be able to leverage what you've learned and have those others out there working towards. You know, what I was trying to say is it's not one person's job. It's it's everybody's job, right? Absolutely. Yes. And that's what I feel like the capacity of the Center for Inclusive Excellence has created for SDSU. Um, our team has a staff, a faculty, and then a student, me, um, learning and development for DEI, creating diversity plans, or um, giving folks the tools to be able to have their diversity vision in their respective colleges, departments, student orgs. Yeah, and this may be too uh, I don't know, existential, but can you talk about you're in Dr. May Fu's class, and 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 you're, we're talking about she's talking about this uh, this idea of inclusion and 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 everybody being having a, a place in the community. Did that just what was your feeling that you felt when when you hear this discussion? Yeah, I think that um, what I learned from that class and and then like how it connected to today, which is so powerful, is um, in order to truly create a community where many people identities feel belonged is to also represent their stories and the pain that they have experienced because of a lack of representation or 
history of their social identities in the United States. Um, it's really awesome, especially with some of the movies and the representation that have happened in the past, I'd say like five years and since 2020 to see how the stories of people coming out and saying, saying they see themselves in the mainstream now. Um, they're not just, for me, my, my takeaway from my healing from Dr. Fu's class is, oh, I don't have to assimilate and become something in the dominant narrative. I have my unique traits and strengths to bring to this country. And um, I think part of the work is continuing to help folks feel welcome by the actions that we take so that they know that they can be included, that we are allies. That, that's, that's powerful. Um, so we talked a lot, or the title of our program involves mindfulness. So tell, talk a little bit more about what mindfulness is and, and how it relates into living into inclusion. Yeah. Um, again, thank you for the organizers for allowing the autonomy for me to pair something that's personal to me in both my social identity, I'd say as well as um, something close to my heart that has helped me in my DEI journey. So uh, I'll go ahead and just like share a very simple definition that we can all follow along with today and kind of like set our headspace for it um, as it relates to like how I see it. I think that mindfulness to its very simplistic gesture or action is awareness and intention. Having a moment to be able to slow down and consider what thoughts are coming up as a result of a lot of things that make uh, like make our identities, our backgrounds, our childhood, all these things create a thought formation. And depending on um, if there's like a positive, a negative, or neutral association with it, it can create an emotion um, and drive our approach. So for me, the most simplistic thing in regards to how it relates to living to in, into inclusion in my work is evaluating, okay, what is this thought? Is there bias attached to it in regards to the concept of implicit bias? and the foundational DEI learning? And is this persuading then my feelings towards somebody or a group? This is um, something that's helped me even to, for example, like hiring committees. When we're looking at resume, when we're reading people's names, um, if someone has a certain communication style, human beings, we have like a thousand thoughts within just a couple of seconds. So being able to stop, have that awareness, it's, you mentioned like listening, like really listening to yourself, listening truly what the other person is saying and understanding it from their perspective and not my, only mine is part of how you can incorporate a different perspective into, um, your thought process and ultimately creating inclusion. Okay. For somebody who doesn't typically practice mindfulness, how would you recommend they they get started or uh, if, if, whether they know intentionally or not whether they're doing it, how would you recommend they, they try to be more intentional? Yeah. So it's just so like, deceivingly simple and when I go back to it I'm just like wow it really is just this um it's giving time to be able to think to be able to see the source of your thoughts or even like piece your thoughts together so for example I'll just use our um, environment today 
thinking like, what are the implications of virtual? And by implications, using some critical thinking of who has access to internet? Who was able to join today? What brought them into this space? What's their time like? Um, just taking time to be able to, I think empathy goes into this, um, really breaking down and being mindful of things that can go into one event. We have implicit associations um, that help us function. It is a part of our human nature to see something, like even my, my Zoom background, green, leaves what does that communicate to you what was i trying to communicate to you there's so much within it and once you realize that and kind of see take your your ego or yourself out of that situation you can actually ask you could say jessica i'd like to invite this into the conversation because i don't want to make assumptions this is my world view why did you have this zoom background today um, that's that's how I think about mindfulness and how it's really um, provided a a tool for me to kind of like break habits or reconsider behaviors that I've um, maybe not even thought about because it's implicit to me. It's um, second nature to me. Yeah, that's uh, that's important. Breaking habits, I think, is is key. One thing, uh, you know, uh, and you can apply this mindfulness in in whether it's just the first time you're meeting someone or communicating with somebody, or if you you're you're looking at how you can measure success in things. We had a, a visit yesterday with uh, with Charlotte Johnson, who's the vice president for student affairs at USD now, and and Charlotte was talking about, uh, you know. It, looking at the how do you measure the success of an of an event where there are a thousand people there well is that that's great but who are those thousand people and more importantly who wasn't there so how can you how can you think about who who didn't have access or who wasn't able to participate and and are they missing some resources that we need to to uh to update so um yeah so i just wanted to uh, that's what made me your your comment made me think about Charlotte's comment about who, in addition to who's there, who wasn't there, who hasn't, who didn't have access. So, things to to keep in mind. What uh, talk about how mindfulness, or actually how meditation, has helped you in in doing your work? Yes. So, um, I guess I'll also say that um, these things often can come together. Um, I wanted to provide kind of like in the spirit of being mindful, um, breaking down the two of them and sharing with you um, where I'm coming from to, to be clear and um, prevent assumptions. So uh, mindfulness is also a concept that is um, more Western secular research from John Cabot Zinn, um, and also Saki Santorelli were some of the first researchers that kind of broke down uh, mindfulness from meditation. Um, meditation, I'm gonna share a little bit of context. Um, so bringing in some of my story too, is, um, is rooted from Buddhism. And um, there are, components of Buddhism that have come into meditation and mindfulness. Um, the reference, in case y'all are interested, that I'd like to share um, my construct today is mindfulness-based stress reduction. And uh, that I think shows an explanation of both things that I'm talking about. Meditation, um, really has its groundings in understanding the breath and your body as a, another tool of practicing uh, mindfulness. I had talked about thoughts and emotions. Um, meditation talks about how your breath can be a subject of a lot of discovery and um, the thoughts that come around it. So for example, do you know when you're breathing in? And do you know when you're breathing out? Do you know when you're holding your breath? It's something that 
is so unconscious to us that being able to even think about the breath can help train the brain to acknowledge thoughts. Um, it also connects you to your body, which um, I uh, am very, it goes back to my story and my social identity of um, holistic, holistic wellness and Eastern medicine. Um, connecting to your body is something that we don't get presented to uh, as much in the West. Um, we might be think a lot externally, a lot with our technology, um, but our body is our source of home. So a lot of the times if you feel stressed or if you have a positive, negative, neutral emotion, your body will react first, if not at the same time. Um, so if you can, if you're having a negative emotion and your stomach is crunching, um, you can kind of uh, understand like, oh, something's happening. So for me, something that um, I'll tie back to our theme today, uh, my other, my passion of DEI, if my stomach, if I feel clenched, then it's telling me, okay, where's this thought coming from? And let's examine it. So do I feel like something's different? And it just makes my body or my ego go into a little bit of like fight or flight. And if so, that signals to me, I, I want to examine it because it's important to see if this is um, a helpful or unhelpful thought towards a person or a situation. And then that allows me to um, start conducting the mindful exercises that I was telling you earlier. Okay. Well, uh, two uh, brief commercials first. Uh, if um, I do want to mention that uh, since you just talked about wellness, our next series following uh, next Tuesday's finale of the DEI and A series is a series on wellness. So we'll have some virtual programs starting in May uh, talking about wellness. And that's a partnership with the School of Leadership and Education Sciences. So uh, so that's something to look forward to. I also want to mention that if you have questions for Jessica, please add them to the Q&A, uh, into the Q&A, and we'll get to them if we can. Uh, we do have a few questions from the registration as well. You talked a little bit earlier about um, allyship. And uh, how would you suggest people who uh, join this webinar either now live or when they watch it on YouTube, how would they, how would you suggest they think about how they can practice allyship to different communities? Um, I know, it, to me, it seems like allyship has to be earned. You can't just say I'm an ally. Um, how would you, where, how would people get started in that uh, understanding more about allyship? Absolutely. I appreciate what you said about um, allyship being earned. Um, allyship is a really big topic that has a lot of components to it and scaffolds to it. So I'm happy to continue talking to people about it as a resource. I think that's a part of allyship um, and creating the continuation and the commitment to the work. Um, how to get into allyship is to know that, like I just mentioned, it's not a one-time thing. It is continuous and requires time is, for me, the simplest way to recognize if you're practicing allyship, if you're taking time to educate yourself, if you're taking time to recognize like, oh, that's something I haven't heard before. Let me look it up. Um, you're taking time to attend programs, to listen, um, because programs is a way to listen um, while speakers are being paid for their emotional labor of sharing their story. Um, at times, allyship with close friends or maybe someone that you know, it's important to ask them if they have the time to talk about it because it's not their responsibility to educate, um, speaking to your point of earning. Uh, so I would say like there's like passive ways of, of allyship like I was sharing. I'd also like to share the forms of allyship to, um, this, this helped me in the beginning of my allyship journey um, as encouragement. 
So I'm going to refer to Deepa Iyer's social change ecosystem model, which talks about many ways that you can contribute to social change and allyship. So uh, some of the examples are allyship can show up as being a weaver. So weaving in, oh, I have power in this circumstance and I can use this platform to amplify someone's voice, like weaving programs together. Um, it can show up through healing. So this is something that I um, think is like one of the core philosophies for my social consciousness work, um, listening, being there for uh, when creating a space that people know they can come to for safety is part of the healing. Um, no one wants to be alone. That is the opposite of belonging. There's also frontline responders, um, there's caregivers, you could make food for people. Um, there's guides showing people the passive education, storytellers. So there's different forms of allyship. Hopefully one of those kind of uh, sparked your excitement for like, oh, I see myself in that now. Um, and then the last thing I'll say that ties it back to my passion of mindfulness is I was kind of thinking about the time, uh, change is the only constant thing. And I was thinking, you know what? Empathy is also one of the only constants or love is the only constants, but maybe it just takes a little bit more effort to think to yourself, did I give love today? Did I think about where someone else was at in their shoes or their place in life? And I think it's, one of the constants in life because we are social beings and we understand what it feels like when somebody provides us connection and love right so sure. being able to provide that um kind of like channeling that while connecting to somebody else as an ally is something that i think will be very rewarding and connecting for the parties involved um i think that Love, the last thing I'll say about love and empathy is um, a student had said to me, um, it's not so much the golden rule, like what you would like to be done to yourself um, and then treat how treat to others how what you'd like to be done for yourself. It's the platinum rule, which is treat to others how they would like something expressed to them or gestured to them. So as you listen and um, channeling like, oh, you know, like what I, what do I feel when I feel truly listened to and offering that space to someone, that relationship building process and that trust building process is the empathy piece of then being able to provide allyship in a way that they would like it and leads to kind of like what you said about earned allyship. All right. The platinum rule that will be uh, certainly a takeaway for me today. Um, I like that. Uh, treat others how you how they want to be treated and how they have platinum rule. All right. Um, we did get a question from a guest. And again, you can use the Q&A feature. And the question was, please tell us about the green leaves on your screen, Jessica. Ah, I love it. Thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs> it's already happening. Um, for me, I was thinking a lot about the background today. Um, it's really funny when we were discussing, I'm actually gonna flip to a different background as I conclude too, cause I wanna promote a heritage month. Um, the leaves was to gesture um, some symbolism that I hold close to my heart in regards to social justice, which is um, one nature, plants, but more, um, Importantly, and I attribute this to the community of social justice and the many leaders that have come before me who created this symbol, but really the roots of a tree and how it can help someone be grounded in their social justice journey and the roots that have long been there before we've come to this work. So I wanted to kind of bring that symbolism into my background today. All right, well, thanks to Helen Finneran for asking that question. So um, 
let's uh, tell me about about some of the challenges you've had in in your work uh, in the in the DEI field and how have you overcome those challenges? Yeah, I am. Um, I want to take a, a moment of authenticity to share because I think that this is um, an important part of our humanity and our humanness that um, I think sometimes isn't shared, but I think is very much the core of social justice to me, which is feelings that we all have. Um, the challenges that I've had in social justice is feelings of guilt, shame, feeling like I haven't done enough, um, feeling like I'm one of the few and I need to be someone who constantly advocates. Um, that was something that was tough as I started my journey because it was like my mind was on overdrive and that's where for me mindfulness really came in to see, okay, this is this work is hard enough and what additionally are you putting on there on your shoulders? Um, and for me, what I've learned is this is the the wonderful thing going back to symbolism of roots and the tree is that it could be hundreds of years of work. Um, and sometimes you have your own journey or your seed that's planted that continues after you. Um, the big picture helps me with remembering that as well as honoring myself. So that's something that I'd like to share too in social justice work. Um, every person is very important and being able to have radical self-care, being able to make space to honor yourself, I think is something that we don't see a lot right now and is contributing to centering humanness and humanity um, within restorative practices or social consciousness. Um, so I'd say that take, take care of yourself. It's as, as much as you are supporting others, you need to be supported too. And your relationship with yourself is something that you're going to have in your lifetime. And being able to give that empathy piece again back to yourself is one of the, I think, a little bit harder sometimes, just as hard um, for me in, in, in the component of this work too. Yeah, I think uh, particularly in the last couple of years uh, with everybody uh, across you know the spectrum going through so much, we do spend, a, a, we don't spend that time uh, practicing self-care and in a way that, especially in, in work where you're, you're, you're working with so many people who may have been harmed in, in a variety of ways and, and you have to be there for them. But if you, if you haven't taken care of yourself, it's, 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 it can be really challenging. So I appreciate that, uh, the, the concept of self-care and its importance. Uh, yeah. Here's, I don't want to be a negative or, or give power to, to those who haven't earned it, but how do you, when you encounter somebody who is less than enthusiastic about your work in the, particularly in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion, how do you handle that? Yeah, no, this is an important question. I think that goes into the challenges question as well as like the self-care question. Um, social consciousness and staying committed to DEI is really a ongoing mental capacity question and revisiting that mindful revisiting part of it. I think that I want to say you, again, to honor humanness, you might show up different every day, depending on if you're having a hard day, having a good day, and sometimes it's it's 100% okay if you see something happen and you just didn't know how to respond, mm -hmm. uh, and and or didn't think fast enough. I I have had that, and I'm working on that. Um, 
what I'd say though is there's many ways to show up kind of like what I was saying earlier. And if you can't show up that day, reflect on it, think, continue to think about it because the more work that you put on, you put into it the next time you, you might have a response or you'll try something else. So um, if you encounter somebody, it might be overwhelming and um, depending on how you show up, uh, it might look different. I'd also say that, um, What's helped me is thinking about the behavior, the learned behavior from years of historic oppression, systems that weren't as welcoming, and critique the behavior and not the person. Um, I, I think that what I was talking about in regards to restorative practices as credit to indigenous communities is not replicating harm um, and violence. And I also like to say this is a, I know this is um, like my philosophy of social consciousness. So I al always welcome, um, take whatever works for you and leave what doesn't. Um, but I would think about the behavior and not the person, because then the ego doesn't get as involved. Um, you can kind of think like asking mindful questions, like where did you get the idea from? Can you clarify a little bit more what, what you said means? And um, I think that also preserves emotional labor because it can get very emotional. DEI yeah. is personal. Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're, I, my, my first defense is to become defensive and that's not, that doesn't help in terms of self-care or doesn't lead to good conclusions necessarily. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's that idea of giving somebody else the power because of the, how they feel rather than how it, how I should feel and, and the work I'm doing or uh, and some, um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Javier asks, the concept of radical self-care is beautiful. How do you apply this concept in your life? You've, you've answered a little bit, but do you want to elaborate on that? Thank you, Javier. So I want to say um, shout out to my student team back in 2019, 2020, because they are the ones that really cultivated this with me. Um, I think I'll say two things. Uh, radical self-care is checking in on myself throughout the day too. Being in a helping profession um, of service, like you mentioned, Charles, you can think about others all day. So radical self-care is honoring your story, your place in allyship and work too. Um, being there for yourself. I think not ignoring yourself to me is um, one of my students had said, like being unapologetically me, like that's important. That's part of me. So yeah. I don't want to erase my own identity, my own experiences. Like that is counterintuitive to this work. And then the other thing is I like to share collective care, community care is something that is very, it's something that we don't, I don't see a lot. And having an accountability partner or knowing some, a couple of people that you can go and have those conversations with builds that place for you to be able to revisit self-care. And kind of like what, we, what um, we were saying in regards to DEI is not just one person's work. Self-care is a community work too. We have a lot of things that we're, trying to deconstruct or unpack in society that we can relate with each other on and supporting each other will help us get through it. I, I do like that idea. Uh, and that concept of self-care is a community effort. Um, we're just about near the end. We've got a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions, please add them into the Q and A. Um, a question that we had from uh, registration how does access related to disabilities play into your work? Thank you so much for this question. Um, 
<laughs> excuse me. So for me, I think in regards to access, I follow the principles of universal design, which it was created by the disability community. Um, some of those principles are creating multiple means of representation, presenting information and content in different ways. Um, I try to think about when I am being mindful and thinking about how I am presenting something, how it can exclude or include communities. Am I excluding our most marginalized identities in how I'm presenting something? For example, if I don't use gender neutral language. Um, another one is multiple means of action and expression. So encouraging uh, different ways to show up. So going back to the platinum rule, um, I can give another example. We were just doing uh, my student team and I interviews for our next year's diversity peer educator cohort. And a candidate asked, what do you mean by allyship in one of our interview questions? And I, I think that the professionalism is, would say, that means they don't know the concept. Um, this, this student was an international student. And what they taught me was, again, checking my assumptions and the limits of what professionalism can mean. And asking ourselves, are we excluding international students? That's another population in regards to um, access. And then lastly, uh, multiple means of engagement. So uh, being able to ask and think through how are people going to arrive at our program today, listening, going to disability ally seminars, to listen again and then to apply. So one of my colleagues in the Center for Inclusive Excellence mentioned that um, Zoom is accessible because it can take a long time for them to get from one meeting to another based on their wheelchair use. And they could miss a beginning of a meeting if not on Zoom. So it is a little harder to juggle logistics because of my um, ableism construct in my brain to be like, oh, this is like, it should be like this. Um, yeah. However, putting in that time again, that empathy of like, okay, I'm toggling hybrid, I'm learning new skills and I'm creating more access is uh, how empathy can be applied and um, my answer to the question of access. That's great. Um, yeah, who's who's in the room and who wasn't able to get in the room or who wasn't uh, invited to come to the room. So um, so now's a great time for you to make the switcheroo on your background. And uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about. Yes, so um, I did want to share with you all that it's Swana Heritage Month. So that's Southwest Asian and North African identities and region. So in the past, um, there has been a week of um, Islam awareness or Muslim awareness week. And um, in, the, in the US and especially at San Diego State, creating Swana Heritage Month um, from our pastor, from the director, uh, at the Center for Intercultural Relations, Paige Hernandez, um, is a decolonial and geographical term that represents various communities located in Southwest Asia and North Africa. And this expands to communities that might not identify as Arab and past uh, religious uh, spiritualities as well. I think that kind of expands more also to the concept of intersectionality. So also understanding how uh, these, these um, heritages and cultures aren't represented, especially in regards to the dominant narratives in the US. So I wanna uh, encourage you all to um, celebrate, get to know Swana Heritage Month a little bit. And I will actually see if I, um, can share with you all. 
I have I have a link. I'm not sure if it went through. And maybe we'll have to share in a different way. Um, yeah, but I, think, I have an educational link too. I think we can share that in the follow up um, uh, response. But uh, uh, unless Kara just didn't was able to share it to everybody. So um, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. Any um, any final recommendations? Um, Kara mentioned this earlier. Uh, thanks to our colleague Kara Marsh Prophet, who's helping behind the scenes. But any uh, final thoughts about? or final recommendations for books on the subject of mindfulness uh, that, that might help our live people or our, those who watch us on YouTube after the Yeah, class. so I, ha I had the book um, next to me. It's the Mindfulness-Based Reduction, I mean, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Workbook. Um, I'd also recommend, I really enjoy Tara Brock and Tara has a, book on radical acceptance. So that's another one of accepting yourself. Um, I'm also reading How to Do the Work, which is uh, recognizing your patterns, heal from your past and create yourself. It's um, from the holistic psychologist, Dr. Nicole Lapara. And um, I have found that doing my own work around my identities and how they've been conditioned for me or even my own triggers can be some of the things that come up when I get defensive or if I'm like trying to exp expand my perspectives as a barrier. So um, for me, I, I would encourage that, uh, maybe this goes back to the concept of like self-love, um, putting like, thinking about yourself too in the journey of allyship. That's that's the first step, self-awareness. So by the way, I've probably done um, 50 or 75 or 100 of these, uh, these alumni spotlights on a variety of topics. And I've often asked that question and no one has ever been as prepared with the three examples of books that she's currently reading right now. So uh, congratulations for, there's no prize, but uh, you, you, you get the, you would get the prize for being the most prepared. And I sprung that question on you. So um, Jessica, it's been wonderful to hear from you and to visit with you uh, to learn about your story. And we're so grateful to have uh, spent this time with you. Thank you again for having me. Um, it's such a great, I think, testament to the community that USD creates for me to be able to come back after many years and kind of revisit where it all started for me. Um, so thank you for having me as well. Well, it's it's been it's been such a pleasure. And again, thanks to Kara for helping behind the scenes along with the Alumni Board's uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force, our sponsors, Valerie Atisha and Jason Harmon and Jessica for sharing with us today. The Living Into Conclusion series wraps up next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific with a session entitled DEI in Corporate America featuring alumna Montserrat Lopez. You can learn all about this series and other alumni association programs by visiting our website, which is alumni.sandiego.edu. And you can also see our previous uh, series programs along with uh, dozens if not hundreds of other uh, programs by going to the USD Alumni Association's YouTube channel. Thank you once again uh, to everybody for joining us, or if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks again, and go Toreros!